Hey, what's going on, Real Players? It's the Bard here, and welcome back to the corner. So, I've been reading some really great comments recently, and some of them have really caught my eye. And this one seems to be a really popular one. Do you think you could do a video for Shadow Sorcery, specifically with ways to use and abuse those wonderful hounds of ill omen? Yep, Shadow Sorcery, a really exciting archetype with lots of really strong effects, whether it just be single class or multi classing. We've already gone over it briefly in our Sorcerer analysis, but let's delve into it a little bit more deeply. So I'll go over all the abilities that the Shadow Sorcerer has and we'll talk about each of them individually. The abilities can combine in specific ways and they can also combine with other abilities from other classes if we choose to use them. So the character's affinity for darkness is really obvious right from the beginning. You get dark vision out to 120 feet and that's with the first level. And that's like twice as good as most dark vision allows. Additionally, when you hit third level, you also learn the darkness spell, which doesn't actually count against the number of sorcerer spells you know. So you're getting a free spell and you can also cast it by using sorcery points instead of by using a spell slot. The important thing to note is that if you cast it using your sorcery points, you can see in the darkness that you create. There is almost no reason never to use the sorcery points. Two sorcery points is the equivalent of a first level spell when it comes to the rate of exchange for your font of magic. So always, 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 if you can, use the sorcery points instead because you're getting a level 2 spell for what is essentially the price of a level 1 without spending any slots and you can see in the magical darkness. The only reason you might really want to use a spell slot instead of the sorcery points is if you're using it with a meta magic technique so maybe something like quicken or perhaps something like subtle because if you want to set up an ambush that's quiet you don't want people to hear your components or if you just need to throw out a quick spell on the fly then quicken is always a good option but unless you're absolutely desperate for one of those metamagic maneuvers you're probably better off just taking the action to cast using sorcery points so a really popular technique particularly for warlocks is the darkness devil sight combination because it allows you to see in magical darkness it is some really effective and some really tasty cheese but if it ain't broke then don't fix it whether you're just going for single class melee sork or if you're going for a multi-class maybe fighter sorcerer or sorcered in combination then this is going to be a really strong option for you because you're getting lots of advantage all the time because you can see in your own magical darkness eyes of the dark works really well for characters like halflings humans and dragonborn because they don't naturally have dark vision so for those characters it's a blessing whereas for any other race, it's kind of a non sequitur, but because it's doubling up the range for most Dark Vision anyway, it's still going to be a bonus. It's only really Dark Elves who aren't getting much benefit because they already have 120 foot Dark Vision, but even then, being able to cast and see in your own darkness is still a benefit because if you're in an area with bright sunlight, you can cast darkness using your sorcery points and you can still see within it. And because the darkness is blocking out the light, you're not going to get disadvantage on any attack rolls. So it's even useful for Drow as well. So Strength of the Grave is one of those abilities that only really works when you're about to get knocked out. It's not something that I would really like. I prefer abilities that I can use all the time. Still, it's an ability that has its place. And because you get it at first level, it's really advantageous when you're starting out when you don't have very many hit points and when you are absolutely desperate to stay alive and the difference between success and failure is usually just one round. This is actually a curious ability because it works in a similar fashion to the half Orc's Relentless Endurance but it doesn't work exactly the same and it's really awkward but it's kind of important that you know how it works. So with Strength of the Grave you can't use it if you take Radiant Damage and you can't use it if you take a critical hit. Now this works fine because Radiant is light and light counters dark, that makes some sense. And if you take a critical hit, you're not likely to make the saving throw anyway because you have to roll 5 plus the amount of damage that was dealt to you. So considering it's a charisma save and you're getting your proficiency on it anyway, you're likely to make that save. Of course a critical hit is going to be really huge damage and you're not likely to save against it. So considering those numbers, it's not actually a problem that critical hits are something that will break the strength of the grave and not allow it to work. So as I was saying, this is going to come in most handy at first level. 
And it's a small rule that's in the death saving throw section, and it's about instant death. If there is damage exceeding your maximum hit points left over after you've been reduced to zero, then you instantly die. At least by using this ability, even though it's not a critical hit, but it's enough for the instant death, if you make the saving throw, you just get reduced to one. So you don't have to worry about instant death when you've got strength of the grave. So our first use and abuse cheesy tactic is going to be relentless endurance and strength of the grave. Because if one doesn't work, then the other one covers it. So if you take a critical hit, strength of the grave doesn't work. But providing, of course, it doesn't kill you outright, as we've already discussed with the instant death rule, then relentless endurance will work instead. Another thing that's worth considering is that if you fail your saving throw, then relentless endurance picks up the slack. So if you do happen to roll a bad number, then you still get reduced to only one hit point because of relentless endurance. What makes this even better is you will technically get a second chance because your strength of the grave only stops working after you succeed at the saving throw. And then you have to take a long rest in order to make it reset itself. So if your relentless endurance goes off because you didn't make your saving throw on strength of the grave, you still have a second chance to make that saving throw if you take damage again. Just a little side note, but it's probably not an important thing that you would need to use, but if you're expecting lots and lots of combats and your character does go down, however you're at the end of a combat, you don't actually have to make the saving throw if you don't want to. If your cleric is able to get you up and about, or if you've got a character with the healer feet who can get you on your feet, you don't have to use your saving throw, because the wording says you can make it, so if you think you're going to need it for another time, then by all means, save it for then. Just don't forget that it's a saving throw. And anything that affects a saving throw can be used to your advantage. And I'm going to use portent in this example, but you can use anything that ups a saving throw, be it a special ability like the Bard's Inspiration or anything like that. Anything that will give you a bonus to your saving throw, be sure to take advantage of it. Say for example, you take 10 damage, it's enough to put you down to zero hit points. You need to roll 15 or more on your saving throw, 2 for your proficiency, and 3 for your ability score modifier. So in that scenario, the 2 cancel each other out, so all you need is a 10. If you've got a diviner in your party, or if you're a diviner yourself because you're multiclassing, you'll know that 10 is a very lackluster number. It's not really good enough for improving attack rolls, but at the same time, it's not quite there for putting on enemy creatures, for getting them to fail attacks and saves. So if you know that you only need enough on the portent roll just to cover the damage you've taken, then that's a very good use for it, and it's not wasted then. Another cheeky thing you can do is if you're playing an Undying Warlock multi-class with Shadow Sorcerer from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, essentially one covers the other. If Strength of the Grave works, you don't have to use your Defy Death. If it doesn't work, you can make your Death Saving Throw and get back up on your feet again, and you haven't wasted your Strength of the Grave. So again, you get that consistent effect of being able to get back up and get back into the fight, even if you are at Death's Door. So at level 6 you get your Hound of Ill Omen and this is where everything starts to happen. For 3 sorcery points you get to summon this thing as a bonus action, what is essentially a dire wolf, just a smaller size. But it also gets additional temporary hit points and it can move through creatures and objects. But most importantly, at the beginning of its turn it automatically knows where the target's location is. So when you unleash this onto your target, you're rather conveniently targeting a creature that's within 120 feet of you, which is the distance of your dark vision now. So already we can start cheesing this thing by using it in the darkness, because anyone who can't see in the dark means they're going to be attacked by this thing, you'll know where they are, and they won't be able to respond to it, because they won't be able to see it for a start. For those targets that can see in darkness, you want to use magical darkness instead, because most dark vision doesn't allow creatures to see in magical darkness. Use your sorcery points for this one, and then you can see the target yourself as well. Again, if you're a multi-class character, particularly a battle master, you can use your battle maneuvers to give additional bonuses to your Hound of Illomen, because it's still a tangible creature. So you can use abilities like Commander Strike to give it an extra attack, or you can use things like Rally to up its temporary hit points if the ones it had before have already been depleted. Your average monster doesn't have very good saving throws. Most of the time they only have their ability scores to go off of, because they don't get their proficiency bonus added on, unless it's a specific creature that has a special resistance to a type of spell or effect. So the majority of the time, you know, creatures get affected by spells quite often. 
Once you get up a few levels, it might be worth considering taking the Confusion spell. Because of the way it works specifically, it doesn't interfere the majority of the time with what your Hound of Ill Omen is doing. If your Hound does get caught in the area of your own Confusion spell, it's not usually a big issue. For example, if it has a random movement and doesn't take any action, the specifics of the ability don't allow it to move in a random direction, it's only allowed to move in a direct path towards its target. This can still be useful in providing things like team advantage or providing saving through disadvantage for the creature. Another thing Confusion does is it has the potential to make a creature use its action to make a melee attack against a randomly determined creature. But again, the specifics of Hound of Ill Omen clearly state it's only allowed to attack the thing that you've targeted, so that's not a problem either. A character who's multiclassed into Warlock can pick up the Ghostly Gaze invocation. But again, this is just another example. It actually works with any spell that allows you to see beyond a particular area. You need to be able to see the target, and it needs to be within 120 feet of you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you need a direct line of sight or line of effect to that creature. Sorcerers have access to divinations like clairvoyance. This will allow you to see a particular creature in an area that you might not physically be able to get to, and still be able to use your Hand of Ill Omen on it as well. You should definitely consider other spells that you can cast on your Hand of Ill Omen. Things like Enlarge are very good, because even though it's only a medium creature, you can still bump it up to large anyway, if that's something that you think you might need. Your Hound is likely to be attacking every round anyway, so getting more damage per attack is going to be good for you anyway. It also says that the Hound can use its action only for attacks against the target. Now, can doesn't necessarily mean must, so I would interpret that as the creature doesn't necessarily have to be attacking. This would be really useful in the case of spells like Charm Person, where the creature remains charmed as long as none of your allies are attacking it. There are other spells that work in a similar way. They will continue to be active as long as nothing's attacking it. So by the wording of the ability, the Hound doesn't necessarily need to attack, but if your DM does decide to rule otherwise, if you've got another spellcaster in your group, have them cast something like, say, Gaseous Form on your Hound of Ill Omen. That way, it will be completely gaseous, there will be no way that it can attack, and it will continue to float towards your target, and that disadvantage will continue to happen as well. I also couldn't find anything that would prevent you from having more than one Hound at a time. At the end of the section about the Hound, it says that it will disappear if the target is reduced to zero hit points, if the Hound itself is reduced, or if five minutes or more elapses. Nowhere does it say that summoning a second Hound of Ill Omen will in any way cause the first one to disappear. So it would seem that you can have as many as you've got the sorcery points for. A few other little things to note, it's still a tangible creature so you can still use it as cover. If your target decides to go on the move, remember that your direwolf has a speed of 50 feet as well, and that can really keep up with the creature that it's after. Also this thing has a really respectable bite, it's plus 5 to hit and it's 2d6 plus 3 damage, that's a very good score. As well as that, it also forces strength checks to so make sure that the targets are making their strength save against the prone effect. You want to be using this as often as you can. If it's going to be attacking every round, there's nothing in the description that says it doesn't get that ability because it is still a dire wolf. And finally, don't forget about the creature's pack tactics ability. As long as one of your allies is within 5 feet of the creature that the hound is attacking, the hound will still get advantage against that target, even if your ally is not on the flank. There isn't an awful lot I can say about Shadow Walk, except for it fits perfectly within your 120 foot range, so you can teleport from place to place as long as you're in dim light or darkness. The only real thing I can think of to cheese this is if you use darkness and then maybe featherfall. So if you've got a wall or something, you can cast darkness up and above and then you appear in that darkness and then featherfall down. So it gives you an indirect route to an area that you wouldn't normally be able to get to but it's the only thing I can really think of because normally this ability is reserved for usually around level 6 for like the shadow monks so it's a bit late to be getting something like this in my opinion anyway still you're likely to be using this all the time the game is dungeons and dragons after all and the majority of your time will be spent in dim light or in darkness even if you go up to something like level 5 or 6 as a paladin and then put the rest of your levels into sorcery, you'll still have enough levels in order to get this ability. As such, 
you can use a bonus action to teleport into a dim area behind a creature and then one of your party members goes on the attack you'll be able to do the whole flanking maneuver for the double advantage so you can then just smite away to your heart's content. Remember also that when light hits an object it causes shadow so the light cantrip can actually be your best friend in some cases. If you cast light in front of an object its shadow will appear on the opposite side and you can teleport into that and it can be a great way to get around certain obstacles. The only other thing I can say about this is that as long as the place is in dim light or darkness and you can see it even just through the smallest of gaps that's all that matters. As long as you can see it, you can get there. Again, with Umbral Form, it's another one of those abilities that I really can't say an awful lot about. This is an amazing defensive and mobility option, all for only 6 sorcery points. Essentially, what you're getting is Stone Skin, that's basically 6 sorcery points by itself. You're getting mobility comparable to something like Gaseous Form, that's 5, and you get it to cast as a bonus action. So if it was quickened, basically that would be 2. This thing is essentially worth 13 sorcery points, but you get it for 6. It really is just giving you such a good deal, I really can't say much more, because you're getting all these spell effects, you're getting it as a bonus action, and you don't even have to concentrate on it either. It just lasts for up to a minute. You can dismiss it early if you want to, but why would you ever need to? and it allows you to cast normal spells and concentration based magic as well. There's really nothing you can cheese with this ability, but I just want you guys to remember that you can use it along with your Strength of the Grave, because you're going to get resistance to all these attacks. If you are getting down to that incapacitated level, you're probably taking too much damage, so I don't know why you're still standing there, but that's neither here nor there. The important thing is, if you do end up using your Strength of the Grave, just remember that you're only taking half damage anyway, which will make the saving throw really easy to make, and you stay then on one hit point, and you won't then lose access to your Umbral Form. You won't have to recast it, it will stay continually working. The same is true also for Relentless Endurance. If it does get you down to zero hit points, you instead go to one hit point. So because you haven't technically dropped to unconsciousness, your Umbral Form remains on until the duration expires. You probably can't really cheese this very much beyond maybe, say, a level 2 of Warlock, just to get yourself a max level Armor of Agathis. If you are going to be in a position where you're going to take advantage of that resistance from your Umbral Form, why not get some retributive damage out of it as well? Other than that, just take whatever precautions you can against being incapacitated, since that's really the main thing that's going to cause this ability to end. Thanks for checking out this video on Shadow Sorcery. The comment had a lot of thumbs up, which I was really impressed about. It seems a lot of you guys really wanted to see this. So hopefully it's given you a few ideas of little ways that you can tweak your Shadow Sorcerer in order to get the most out of it. As with any other piece of delicious cheese, make sure you don't overindulge because your DM is likely to throw a book at you. If you guys like this video on Sorcerer shenanigans, then leave a like. If you've had your own experiences with tasty and delicious cheese, leave a comment down below. And if you're not subscribed, why not consider doing so? And you can see more videos on sneaky shenanigans in the near future. And with that being said, I will see you guys next time at the gaming table. <laughs>